in Matthew's gospel, the crowds had been growing. Jesus' ministry has been building word, getting out about the healings and the miracles, that there's something going on in this person that is of God. And so Jesus heads up the hillside and begins to preach. He begins this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, with the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, blessed are the merciful, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And he's encouraging them to pray, and then he says to them, pray in this way, and he offers them a prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer to hold on to on wonderful days and on really difficult ones. That same prayer comes to us and will shape our journey here in the season of Lent, this 40-day journey towards the cross as we are prepared for Easter. It is a gift to be with you for worship at Westminster this, this Lord's Day, this first Sunday in Lent, whether this is your first time or you've worshiped with us online or before that in our pews for many years at 8.30 or 11, it is, it is a gift to be together. We are glad that you are here. Our bulletin can be found on the website, wpcdurham.org, and you can read along with the liturgy and sing the hymns, which will also be on the screen. I'm grateful to musicians who continue to sing and play in their homes, to Susan for lighting the Lent candles, and to Chuck for serving as lector, to colleagues on camera and behind the scenes. Friends, the Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us together worship God. join me in the call to worship, which is on your screen. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In him is life, and that life is the light of all. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. In him is life, and the life is the light of all.
Please join me now in a time of confession using the words printed on your screen. Why do we confess our sin? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But why do we do this together? Because we are a community, a covenant people. Then let us confess our sin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Please take a few moments now for silent confession. Friends, hear this good news. Who is in the position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ lived for us, Christ died for us, Christ was raised for us, Christ prays for us. In Christ, I tell you we are forgiven. We are a new creation. Live in this peace. Amen. be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Good morning. My name is John Messick and I'm chair of Westminster's Ways and Means Commission. I wanted to take a few minutes to thank you for the pledges to our 2021 stewardship campaign called Grace in the Wilderness and to tell you about the church's operating budget for this year. Each year, the pledges that we all make to Westminster help chart the course and the opportunities the church will undertake in the coming year. I think that sometimes we can slip into thinking of stewardship only from the institutional perspective which is a process by which the church raises funds and applies those funds towards creating an annual budget. But stewardship is really a lot more than just that. It's a spiritual discipline for each of us. It's a time for us to think about how we are stewards of God's blessings in our own lives and how we might give back in ways that honor God and strengthen God's church and people. Last fall in worship, we studied Jeremiah 31, especially uh, the verse two, and we asked ourselves, where have we seen grace in the wilderness during such a challenging year? Through your pledges, you have been the grace in the wilderness for Westminster Presbyterian Church and for the communities in which we serve. <clears throat> the Stewardship Committee asked you to step up and you did. You gave generously and extraordinary times. More than one third of you increased your pledges over last year's. 10% of you embraced pledging for the first time ever and over half of you renewed your faithful giving for the new year. Again, thank you. As you know, it's the responsibility of the Ways and Means Committee to facilitate and watch over the financial health of the church. I'm honored to report that through the excellent work of our Finance Committee, led by Amy Simonson, along with oversight of the Ways and Means Commission, we were able to develop and pass an operating budget that allows our church to step up in significant ways. 
Our budget will allow us to continue offering meaningful support to our community partners. It will allow us to upgrade our website and online presence. It will bolster our operational infrastructure to support our growing ministries and to secure needed repairs and equipment updates for our campus. None of this would have been possible without your pledges, and we are also very grateful. Lastly, I want to mention that in the coming weeks, you'll be hearing more from us as we prepare a plan for paying off the construction loan for our new fellowship hall. This will be a top priority for Ways and Means in 2021, so please be prepared as we continue to bring more information to you. In closing, thank you for your financial support of Westminster community in these challenging times. We must remain connected as much as we can and never forget that no matter what the challenge is, we're all brothers and sisters bound by the love of gra and grace of Jesus Christ. So on behalf of your Ways and Means Commission, thank you again for all you do for our church. Good morning, young Christians. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, the time we get ready to celebrate the mystery of Easter. But we need a way to help us get ready. Prayer is one way that will help us focus on the things that mattered the most to Jesus. That might be why Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He said, when you pray, say these words, Our Father who art in heaven. Do those words sound familiar to you? I hope so. Now we now call the prayer that Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer. And it's prayed by Christians all around the world. This Lenten season, we are encouraging everyone at Westminster to commit to praying the Lord's Prayer. Some people have decided they're going to pray it every day. Some people are going to learn it in a different language. That's what I'm going to try. I'm going to try to learn it in American Sign Language. And my sister, who is an interpreter for the deaf, is going to help me. I thought it might be fun and it might actually help me a little bit as well if I teach you some of the signs that she is teaching. So let's start at the beginning. Our Father. Now notice it's not my Father. The word is our Father. Jesus addresses this to our God because God doesn't belong to just one person. Instead, we all belong to God. So that means that this is the prayer for the whole church. It is our prayer. Next week, we'll talk a little bit more about the word Father, but for now, let's just learn those first two words in ASL, American Sign Language. The word our looks like this. We cup our hands and then we arc it to our opposite shoulder. Our. Our. The word father is different than the sign for our earthly father. Instead, it is our father in heaven. So it starts with the letter A, which makes a fist. You can use both hands and touches your forehead. And then the other fist touches or comes close to that hand and then goes up to heaven. Father, Father, our Father. Now I'll be back next week and we can learn a little bit more from a different phrase. For now, let's close with a prayer that starts with the same first two words. And I invite you to repeat after me. We'll start together though with our Father using American Sign Language. Are you ready? Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for teaching us how to pray. 
Amen. See you next week. Throughout the season of Lent, we will sing together this prayer of illumination. Verse 1 of the hymn, I want Jesus to walk with me. from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will go get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But when he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on, a on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, 
who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You kill the cat, fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother's, brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every single one of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Ash Wednesday, just a couple of days ago, we settled in the evening for worship. Our readers shared a powerful call from the prophet Isaiah and a psalm of penitence and a word from Matthew chapter 6 that Mary DeBard read at the lectern right over there. Chapters 5 and 6 and 7 in Matthew are the, is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gathers the growing crowds and begins with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. And in chapter 6, he's talking about how we engage the practices of faith. Don't, don't sound a trumpet when you give alms. Don't pray loudly at church when you, to draw too much attention to yourself. Don't fast and then groan about how hungry you are and how hard fasting is and how Jesus must love you more. When you pray, don't use too many words. And then, in the part the lectionary skipped, Mary read before and after, but in the part the lectionary skips, Jesus shows us how. He's been talking about how not to be wise and showy and how to make your piety meaningful. And he says, pray then in this way. And then he offers them the Lord's Prayer. And this simple prayer has been at the heart of our faith for centuries. We learn it when we're young. We repeat it each week. It remains lodged in our minds when other things may fail towards the end of our lives. And our family with two preachers and three kids and a puppy online worship can still get kind of chaotic. And there are some weeks the Lord's Prayer is the only time that we hear all five human voices together. But we do. We say it together. It holds us together. And so the prayer comes in, in, in two parts, kind of larger parts, each with three petitions. The first three focus on God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, of thy kingdom come. And then more about us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, lead us not into temptation. And we thought it wise that this Lent, stuck in the middle of a pandemic and all sorts of craziness, all of us having lost so much, that it might be useful to reach back to this old prayer. In a year that has tested our ability to pray, Jesus says, when all else fails, on good days and on harder ones, here is something we can pray together. And so today we'll spend not enough time on our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the first point is, 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 is about this first word, our. And this word does not imply ownership. We know this, that God doesn't belong to us, but when we say our Father, whether alone or with others, we are bound up with other people as we pray these same words. Well, there are certainly elements of our faith that are intensely personal, as in between us and God. It is quite impossible to be a follower of Jesus by oneself. Our Father is distinct from my Father. It is always a, a, a plural us, we, our, which is both a comfort and a challenge in that we are not in this alone, and that we pray alongside saints from centuries ago and people down the street who have lived faithful lives that inspire us and people who have been through hardships beyond what we can imagine. We pray this prayer with them. That's a tremendous comfort. But also sometimes unpleasant because we don't get to choose who our is. That's the complexity of real community, we pray this prayer connected to all who belong to God, who God claims and loves, which means God decides and we don't. People like us and quite different. People who vote differently and treat people differently and come from very different places. 
would be much more convenient, much more convenient, preferable many days, if we could love God the way we wanted to without being bothered by other people and their opinions, wouldn't it? But when we say our Father, God wraps God's arms around us all as we pray together. Our Father, this next word, Alwyn, wonderful saint of the old Southern Presbyterian Church who, church, who, serves church, who served churches in Decatur, Georgia, and Richmond, and as president of Louisville Seminary, read a really great book. It's kind of a compilation called The Christian Primer, which is a series of sermons on, on the prayer and the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments. And he says, well, that when we begin the prayer with our Father, this Father in particular, we're in danger of ascribing to God, consciously or unconsciously, a maleness that is not theologically theologically correct and has done great harm, he says. Continues to do great harm. I think we'd agree. This language has been used by the church to argue over the centuries that women are less than men in the eyes of God, have a lesser role in the home or workplace, and continues to be used by too many Christians to deny women from serving in all ministries of the church. These assumptions are deeply rooted and remain all around us. We must be a people who reject any theological system that doesn't hold all people as equal in the church or our neighborhoods or anywhere else, frankly. But I also think we need to take care and be be discerning and wise and not reject this language entirely. It's clear language from Scripture that Jesus himself uses. We must be aware of the assumptions underneath all of our language and seek to use language at least as diverse as Scripture uses when we dare to speak of God. But, but this use of Father is also about a God we can have a deep and intimate connection with, not a God who is the worst of earthly fathers, but the best beyond the best, beyond what we can imagine. This is why I had to also read the, the, the magnificent parable of the prodigal son, when we pray, our Father, we wonder what we know about that kind of God. What is, what is, what is that Father like? Who is that? The Scripture tells us who that is. That that God, our Father, rushes out to us. As the, the text from Luke says, no matter who we are or what we have done on our worst days, no matter where you might have been, If we ask for our inheritance early and strike out and embarrass everyone and then come home filled with shame, God rushes out to you. Running down the hill with his robe flapping all over the place, looking ridiculous, that God who loves us, who loves you with reckless abandon, that's the one to whom we pray when we pray our Father. Which would leave us at a nice little moment if we didn't have this note about location. Our Father, the one who knits us all together and who invites us all to the party, is in heaven, Jesus says. First, to the point about personal piety, Willimon and Hauerwas note in the little book on the prayer that I hope you'll join, join a group of us who are reading our way through this season. They say, If Jesus resides safely tucked in our hearts, if God is only a wish projection of the very best of human aspiration and experience, then forget it, they say. These little gods are no match for our problems. We have this God who connects us in community, who we, who we dare to approach in, in, in a deep and personal and intimate way, but who also, we are reminded by the phrase, who art in heaven, is not from here. Again, God came to earth as Jesus and walked alongside us. What we know about God, we know in Jesus, but also, but God is also, thanks be to God, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other, beyond us all, transcending all of creation, even on its best day. I don't think spending much time on the details matters if heaven is up or down or all over the place or streets paved with gold or whatever Whatever image from Scripture or from wherever else you have in mind, we are bold to pray to the God who created the universe and reigns over it all, who is both with us and far beyond us. However, and this is Willimon and Hauerwas again, because we call God the Father who is in heaven, we are bold to pray for such absurdly extravagant gifts as bread for the world and peace among nations and healed marriages and cured cancer and rain We are bold to pray for such gifts because we pray to the Father in heaven, the one who rules. 
And if we haven't slowed down, slowed down quite enough after our Father who art in heaven, if we're still moving too quickly, we should pause when we say, Hallowed be thy name. We don't usually take this much time to address someone, right? Hi, Sherry. Hi, Alex. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hi, Mom or Dad. We take this time here because we know that even many more words can't fully glimpse who God is. And so we say, this God who created it all and rules in love, who we have a, a relationship with, intimate, closer than the best parent who is above us and beyond us, holy is your name, O God. May your name be always known and seen as holy, set apart, distinct. May God's name always be different from other names, more respected, more honored, overwhelmed with with divine mystery and power and awe. We We don't rush into saying God's name. We pause. We think about why we might say it. We take time because God's name is worth every bit of honor we can offer, and worth taking great care when we say God's name, not just in a Ten Commandments, don't take God's name in vain kind of way, but honor and respect come with discernment. When a public leader tosses tosses out God's name, especially to support his policy or military action, or when we in our lives take really seriously who God calls us to be, what God calls us to do, We are to live holy lives, lives in touch with the name of God who is hallowed, who is holy, and whose holiness is even now all around us. I think I've mentioned before that most of the handful of the most powerful spiritual experiences of my life have been at church basements and meetings of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. That disease has found its way into both Carrie's family and mine, as I suspect in yours. I remember one late December evening in a basement almost 20 years ago. It was my first time, and at the end, this wonderful group of people all stood up and held hands. Everybody seemed to know what to do and what they were doing, but I didn't, and I also wasn't sure I fit in, and I definitely wasn't sure I wanted to hold hands, (laughs) but I did. And then after a moment of silence, a voice began. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I was a little surprised, but even then I knew what they were doing. They were trying to pray to the one who was with them and beyond them, their holy parent and beloved friend who they believed had the power to change them. And in their joy and in their grief, they offered themselves to God in that prayer. And those voices in that church basement joined the chorus with saints from ages past and our family in the living room watching church online, to the church where your grandparents grew up, to these pews wherever you sit today. We're all bound up in this prayer together. It holds us. And that is good, good news. All praise be to God. Amen.
In response to God's word, please join me as we say what we believe, using the words displayed in the screen and in today's bulletin from the Apostles' Creed, the ecumenical version. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, dear friends. It is time for the announcements. First off, we are having our virtual courtyard this Sunday today, right after worship, just like we would hang out uh, out in the courtyard if, if we we're all here together in the church. We are getting together on Zoom to chat. We can talk about the sermon, but we really don't have to if you don't want. It's totally up to y'all. You can get the link in the bulletin um, that was uh, shared today. Also, a friendly reminder that we will have a congregational meeting at 12 noon next Sunday, February 28th, for the purpose of approving the at-large slate members for the nominating committee and the terms of call for the pastors at Westminster. A link to the Zoom meeting will be sent out in this week's newsletter, so watch for that. Um, I think it's a very holy opportunity to have your voice heard and a great way to remember that this church is all of our churches, and so um, I hope you'll be there. Also, uh, it is Lent. Lent can be a rich time to deepen our connection with God and with one another. Jesus prayed and taught his followers to pray, to wash feet, to share bread and wine, and in doing so, the community is formed as Christ's body. We are encouraging y'all to take on some new practices to uh, recognize Lent and to celebrate it. Just as light was central to our season at Advent, we invite you to designate one candle to be your in-home Christ candle. So we lit the candles on Ash Wednesday and invite you to light your own along with us as we go through the Sundays of Lent. You may add another candle for each week or just light your Christ candle, whichever you would prefer. Also, the sign of the cross reflects the nature of our Trinitarian God. Rather than receiving ashes on our forehead on Ash Wednesday, we learned about the sign of the cross and we will be continuing to practice it in our prayer life throughout this season. Finally, Marita talked to us during the children's message and Chris preached about it beautifully during the sermon about the Lord's Prayer. You are invited to participate this year in the Lord's Prayer Challenge. In times when so much is uncertain, it is a gift to have this prayer given to the disciples by Jesus as a gift of prayer that can hold us as individuals and as a community. We encourage you to pray the Lord's Prayer each day or maybe even learn the Lord's Prayer in another language. You can also sign up to receive daily reflections throughout the season. Check today's bulletin for the details and sign up for this as well. Um, there are a whole lot of really cool Lenten offerings going on, so make sure you're reading the bulletin. Finally, our dear friend and ninth grader, Riley Meath, has organized a diaper drive. We are going to be distributing diapers to people who need them over at Iglesia Emanuel. The details for all that, for how you can get diapers to Riley and then to the folks at IEP is in your bulletin. So again, definitely make sure you're looking at that. Dear friends, uh, as we transition to a time of prayer, I invite you now to center yourself. Um, and think about what God is showing you. What are you excited about? What are you concerned about? Where is your heart yearning for something? Where is your heart hurting? Um, a list of these can be found uh, in our church uh, prayers and concerns. If you would like to see the full list, Sherry would be happy to email that to you. Um, but take a minute to center yourself as we pray together.
holy God. You are the author of a faith most durable. You gave us scripture that all these years later continues to mystify and strengthen and challenge and comfort. You give us a community with which we can celebrate and with which we can grieve, with which we can work and with which we can play. You give us prayers that work in good times. You give us prayers that also work in harder times. Lord, you are a God of every season, and we thank you for this. We praise you for this. We thank you for the spareness, for the simplicity, for the beauty in the desert that is Lent. We pray that in the darkness, in the wilderness, you will show us flowers. We pray that we might be waited on by angels in our time of fasting and penitence. We pray that you will be with us. We pray that you will make your spirit felt in this place, in every heart. We pray that our worship will be genuine. We pray that our faith might blossom into deeds. And we pray that we might learn to love you more perfectly. Bless this day our city, bless our church, bless our state, bless this country and our world. Teach us to live together peaceably and equitably. Give us hearts for justice. Give us legs and arms that can work hard to bring about the kingdom which you have envisioned for us. Give us discernment and wisdom and humor and grace so that we can work out our faith and our work together. Help us to listen to one another more often than we speak. Lord, we pray this day for all who are in prison, for all who are sick, for all who are hospitalized. We pray that you will heal bodies. We pray that you will heal minds. We pray that you will heal division, that you will heal marriages. Lord, we pray that you will be a healing presence, a wholesome presence among us this day. Lead us into a complete faith. Walk with us, pray with us, pray through us as we pray with saints from down the street and from centuries ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. It's our custom during this time to take a moment to consider how we will give of ourselves, of our time, of our resources, of our money to the church, to God, to one another throughout this week. So I invite you to take that time now. Let us pray together in a spirit of thanksgiving. Lord, we come before you gracious. We come before you grateful. We pray that you will give us wisdom, that you will give us kindness and compassion, so that all we have might be turned out for the sake of the vulnerable and for your glory. Amen. Amen. And so as the crowds grew and grew, Jesus made his way up the mountain. And there on the side of the mountain, on the, on the magnificent Sermon on the Mount, in the midst of all these other amazing teachings, he says, hey, here's how you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he offers this prayer to them as a gift. A gift that all of us disciples since have been grateful for and has held us. I, I challenge you to pray it to hold on to it each day of this Lenten season as it holds on to you as we move through this journey of preparation together for the drama and majesty and weight and glory of Holy Week and of Easter. So no, 
Friends, as we go this day, as we live and love and serve and pray, know it is good news that we don't go to figure it out by ourselves. For that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each of us, with each of you, every step of that journey. And all God's people say, Amen. Go with us, Lord, and guide the way through this and every coming day, that in your Spirit, strong and true, our lives may be our gift to you. Go with us, Lord.